thank you so much for that uh, humble in introduction, Dr. Ashish, and uh, thanks to ESI for inviting me to this uh, activity. So what we'll discuss over a period of time is diagnosis of diabetes insipidus, how to go about it, what are the practical challenges we face day in and out. I hope my slides are visible now. Yes, yes ma'am. Right, thank you. So if we understand diabetes insipidus, simply put, is a disorder of water homeostasis. And the three main regulators are, the three main determinants are the secretion of arginine vasopressin from the uh, hypothalamus and posterior pituitary, its action at the level of the renal tubule, and thirst regulation. Now, if we look at the water homeostasis, almost 170 liters of free water gets filtered at the glomerulus every day. And most of it, about 70%, is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule through constitutively expressed aquaporin-1 channels. The rest is absorbed in the distal tubule and the loop of Henle through aquaporin-2 channels, which are not expressed as such. The loop and the distal tubule are basically water impermeable. But on the action of arginine vasopressin, there's increase of adenylate cyclase activity and translocation of aquaporin-2 to the luminal surface. This makes this uh, cell permeable to water, which then transports, translocates from the uh, lumen into the cell, the principal cell, and then via constitutively expressed aquaporin-3 and 4 channels, across an osmotic gradient, it enters the renal medullary interstitium. Aquaporin-2 expression is basically by and large regulated by arginine vasopressin, which is secreted from neurons in the hypothalamus and then is tra translocated across the neuronal axons to be secreted into circulation from posterior pituitary. The key regulator of AVP secretion is plasma osmolality, but it also responds to changes in blood volume and blood pressure and physical stress, several medications. More recently, apelin, a potent diuretic peptide has been uh, identified, which inhibits arginine vasopressin secretion, and it is produced by the same hypothalamic, uh, by the hypothalamic neurons in the same region. Now, as I said, that plasma AVP is closely regulated or responds to very small fluctuations in plasma osmolality, such that a, a small increase in plasma osmolality would cause a sharp increase in AVP secretion, and a small decrease in AV, uh, plasma osmolality would cause a fall in AVP secretion. The same is true for thirst mechanism. A slight increase in plasma osmolality will trigger thirst and intake of water so as to restore homeostasis. Now, diabetes insipidus is characterized by polyuria and polydipsia, primarily either due to deficient secretion of the arginine vasopressin or its deficient action. That means the defect would either lie at the hypothalamic pituitary region or would be at the action of the action site of AVP, that is the kidneys. The hallmark is hypotonic dilute insipid urine. That's how the nomenclature starts. But the differential diagnosis of this condition is wide. And we have to remember what is called as the polyuria polydipsia syndrome, which can include central or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, which can also include increased intake of water due to several reasons, something called primary polydipsia, or it can include gestational diabetes, which is unique to pregnancy. There's a wide variety of causes listed for both central and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Almost about 10% of the entire cases are congenital or inherited, while the large majority, 90%, are acquired. Now, if you look at the congenital causes, mutations can be there in the AVP gene itself or in the Wolfram gene. Uh, which is classically associated with what is called as dit mode syndrome, wherein diabetes mellitus usually presents much early, uh, about five, six years of age. Then optic atrophy develops by 10, 15 years of age. And it is in the second decade of life that there might be diabetes insipidus might develop. They may also have sensorineural deafness. This uh, disorder, fortunately, is very rare. The acquired causes form a large majority of the cases, which can result from trauma to the hypothalamic or posterior pituitary region or any surgery in that region. In fact, 
post-operative central diabetes insipidus has been reported to occur in as much as 10 to 30 percent of pituitary surgeries depending on centers. Then there can be vascular causes, tumors of this area, chronic granulomatous diseases like Langerhans cell histiocytosis, sarcoidosis, neurosarcoidosis, infections, autoimmune condition in fact remains again a very common uh, cause of central diabetes insipidus with or without associated hypopituitarism. Then snake venom uh, phenytoin, but about a large majority will remain still idiopathic where we can't identify any of these reasons. Then is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Again, the congenital forms are much less common. The congenital forms usually occur in the first five to six years of life and uh, the presentation is more florid. Among the acquired commonest is lithium-induced diabetes insipidus of nephrogenic origin, but there are other drugs which have been categorized. Two common metabolic causes of diabetes insipidus could be hypercalcemia and hypokalemia, which would impact the effect of uh, the AVP on the aquaporin 2 channels. So they hinder the effect of AVP on aquaporin 2 channel translocation. Then infiltrating diseases of the kidney or other kidney diseases, especially post-obstructive uropathy, acute or chronic kidney failure, renal infarction, and even the autosomal poly polycystic kidney disease can have tubular dysfunction presenting as nephrogenic DI. During pregnancy, what happens is there's increased production of placental vasopressinase, which increases the degradation of AVP. So gestational diabetes insipidus might appear in the second trimester or early third trimester, and usually resolves on its own after delivery within one to one and a half months. Primary polydipsia is commonly seen in association with psychiatric diseases, and this is called psychogenic polydipsia but there can be other central disorders also which affect the thirst mechanism. So dipsogenic DI, this could be idiopathic or it could be associated with CNS, inflammatory tumor and other diseases. Now, looking at diagnosis, the entire protocol should follow clear, crystal clear steps. First and foremost is confirmation of polyuria. That's very important. Confirmation of hypotonic polyuria is the next as is visceris to differentiate it from osmotic diuresis causes of polyuria. Determining the type of the polyuria polydipsia syndrome is a central nephrogenic primary polydipsia or gestational and thereafter determining the etiology. Like always in every disorder, a clinical history and physical examination is of utmost importance. What is the age of onset of symptoms and rapidity of symptoms? Now, a congenital or nephrogenic usually come with a more rapid and younger age of onset of symptoms, while primary polydipsia would tend to have a gradual onset of symptoms in a more fluctuating course, wherein there would be periods when the polyuria tends to improve on its own. What is the amount of urine passed? What, is there nocturia or uh, enuresis in the patient? Uh, what about thirst and water intake? Rare forms especially of central origin can have adipsia associated. That means lack of thirst. And it can in fact be very serious because that means they are not going to be able to compensate for the excess urine being paused, passed out and they will have significant free water deficit. So adipsic uh, forms of TI can result in significant hypernatremia. In children, irritability, growth retardation, failure to thrive could be indicators of inherited forms of TI or tumor or other associated causes of TI. Severe cases, especially like those with adipsia, may have hypernatremia, mental augmentation, IC bleeds. So a clear clinical presentation and evaluation is important. We should also in the background look for causes which could have caused TI from the history and physical examination. That means any history of head trauma, is it a post-traumatic presentation of polyuria? Is it a post-surgical polyuria? Are there anterior pituitary deficits which could point towards pituitary and hypothalamic tumors or inflammatory or granulomatous causes? CNS localizing signs such as cranial nerve palsies, again, could be pointers towards an underlying etiology. A clear medication history of psychiatric medications of lithium or other drugs which could trigger uh, DI. Any known systemic psychiatric or renal disease also should be evaluated for 
And as I said, congenital diabetes insipidus usually occurs very early. And if it presents with severe dehydration in boys at a young age, we should suspect X-linked nephrogenic DI. Now, how do we confirm polyuria at what level we say this urine output is really abnormal? Uh, there are criteria given as per age. By and large, for adults, it's more than 50 ml per kg per 24 hours. But for children, it's a little higher, until two years of age, 100 to 110 uh, ml per kg per 24 hours. So a documentation of the actual urine volume might help rule out patients who actually have just an uh, increased frequency or urgency of picturition and not true polyuria. We should also look for thirst and what is the amount of water intake. Polydipsia, usually people will be uh, consuming more than three liters of water per day, but maybe even higher, 10, 12 liters. We've had those patients also. Now, when we are evaluating for polyuria, it's important to exclude cases which are not true polyuria. That means frequency of urgency of micturition or dysuria, wherein the patient has a perception that too much urine is being passed, but actually it is not. So look for features which are not true polyuria. Also look for osmotic diuresis, such as factors, diabetes, stress, hyperglycemia. Is the patient taking SGLT2 inhibitors? Is the patient taking diuretics? What about a high protein intake, catabolic states, or recovery from acute renal failure? Or let's say in an admitted patient with head trauma, is it mannitol which is causing polyuria? So again, all of these things we have to rule out. And then the differential goes on to diabetes insipidus versus primary polydipsia. The next step is confirmation of hypotonic polyuria, which is very, very important. So initially we should evaluate urine osmolality and our specific gravity. The specific gravity is a very easy test to perform and it can be used as a substitute to urine osmolality, at least for initial evaluation, but specific gravity would depend on both size and number of particles. So false lows are not very common, but false elevated values can happen. So if your specific gravity is low, it does indicate that there's hypotonic polyuria, but a normal specific gravity does not exclude it out. So it might be useful in a neurosurgical unit where you want rapid results, but for further accurate testing, it might not be very reliable. The other initial evaluation should include serum electrolytes and calcium, estimation of plasma osmolality. Now, I'm not aware about other countries in between, Mostly in our country, what we get from labs is an estimated plasma osmolality, which is calculated using this formula, wherein blood glucose is in milligrams per DL and blood urea nitrogen also is in milligrams per DL. Assessment of renal functions, plasma glucose, as well as serum calcium is important. A low urine osmolality of less than 300 basically means that what we are dealing with is polydipsia, polyuria syndrome. Now, what are the initial pointers? If the urine osmolality is high, more than 800, it practically excludes diabetes insipidus as a differential diagnosis, also excludes primary polydipsia. But if the urine osmolality is low, along with elevated serum sodium and elevated plasma osmolality, it basically points towards diabetes insipidus. In primary polydipsia, you do not usually see hypernatremia or hyperplasma osmolality. And the serum sodium or plasma osmolality usually tends to be lower or uh, at the lower end of normal ranges. But however, most patients will form in the indeterminate ranges of urine osmolality and further testing would be required. We'll take one case scenario as we go along. This was in fact my first experience out of institute when starting practice of a child with polyuria polydipsia syndrome. An eight year male child landed up in the emergency with a history of generalized tonic-clonic seizures. He had a recent history of polydipsia of almost six to seven liters per day and polyuria with nocturia, had cravings for cold water and liquids, growth and other examination parameters were all normal. In the last three days, he had seen two specialists for these polyuria polydipsia syndromes who had labeled him with central diabetes insipidus and started him on desmopressin. What was given in the history to us was that he has only up till now taken only two doses of desmopressin. One was on the morning of admission, he came to the ER at night and one was the night before. 
at presentation, he had altered sensorium and serum sodium was actually low. Then we reviewed what recent records had happened. Apparently, these reports, the urine reports had already been reviewed by the previous specialist, but the plasma and serum reports were not available to them. Urine specific gravity was low. There was no glucosuria. Urine osmolality was clearly low. But serum sodium and plasma osmolality were also borderline low. And the MRI they had requested for, but was not available. Now, what happened in the hospital was even further interesting. It was challenging because we didn't really know how to monitor this patient and how to manage the fluid balance. So we did an hourly intake output monitoring and started with isotonic saline only. And we monitored electrolytes and osmolality almost every four hours. We did an MRI, which came out completely normal. The posterior pituitary bright spot was present. The pituitary stalk was okay. The child improved in sensorium. By 48 hours, with an IV fluid rate only of 60 ml per hour, his sodium had normalized. And strangely enough, his urine output had actually reduced and normalized, in fact, over the next week to about one liter. Thirst persisted, but the oral intake, possibly the child had limited access to water in the hospital. So his oral intake had started to fall. At 24 hours, his urine osmolality had crossed 300. And at 48 hours, it was clearly normal. And in retrospect, when we further again took a history from the family, this patient gave a history of classical features of obsess uh, obsessive compulsive disorder with frequent compulsive hand washing and a lot of other symptoms. So psychiatric evaluation came up with a diagnosis of OCD. And since the last 12 years, this patient has been undergoing treatment under the psychiatrist and has had everything normal. So the carry on message here is, do not assume diabetes insipidus. Correct diagnosis is very important and a mislabeling of primary polydipsia as diabetes insipidus can really be dangerous. So I think we should not use shortcuts in our treatment or diagnostic protocols when it comes to polyuria polydipsia syndrome. So in those cases where the diagnosis is not clear cut on the baseline investigations, we must proceed with what is called as indirect water deprivation test, wherein we are indirectly assessing AVP secretion. We are not actually measuring AVP, but assessing the secretion of AVP and its action at the kidney in response to dehydration and desmopressin administration. So upfront speaking, it is very, very, the philosophy of this test would be very simple, that in the first phase of water deprivation, people who are normal or who have primary polydipsia would concentrate urine, while those with diabetes insipidus would not concentrate urine. In the second phase, after we administer desmopressin, those with congenital uh, DI would respond by concentrating urine, while nephrogenic would not. So the protocols have been well laid out that we must correct this electrolydemia, stop any medications at least 24 hours prior, which might affect urine output. That includes caffeine and smoking. For those who have significant polyuria, the test can be started in the morning. For those with mild polyuria, the water deprivation can be started at home at night and they can report early morning for admission. Baseline measurements of weight, heart rate, blood pressure, measurements of osmolality, serum sodium, urine osmolality, where possible AVP or copeptin could be measured. However, those facilities are not available with us. So the patient is under kept NPO under strict supervision so that unsupervised fluid intake does not happen. And a regular monitoring of vitals as well as urine output and osmolality should be done, even serum osmolality and plasma osmolality. When to terminate the test, if two consecutive urine osmolality values vary less than 30, or there is a body weight loss of 3 to 5% or beyond. Serum sodium is beyond 145, or there's a rise in plasma osmolality above normal, or patient develops distressing symptoms like intractable thirst or orthostatic hypotension. At that point, samples are again taken, and two micrograms of desmopressin, intravenous or intramuscular, is administered, and the sampling is done for one to two hours, and the patient is allowed to take adequate uh, free water. Uh, the oral or nasal formulations are not preferred because their absorption for this for the purpose of this test would remain unpredictable. Simply put, what will happen? Normal people would concentrate urine on water deprivation. So plasma osmolality, uh, the urine osmolality would rise above 800. DI patients will not concentrate. So it will remain below 300. 
on giving desmopressin, central DI patients will respond by a more than 50% increase in urine osmolality, while nephrogenic DI would not. The tricky part is these patients who have partial forms of nephrogenic or central DI, where some amount of urine concentration will happen, and the urine osmolality may rise between 300 to 800, and also the patients who have primary polydipsia, which would also, again, partially uh, concentrate urine. So let's take another lady uh, from my clinic. She had hypertension, irritable bubble syndrome, and depression. She came with polyuria, nocturia symptoms since two months and had dryness of my mouth and thirst. Oral intake of water was almost five liters plus per day. She was on omeprazole, duloxetin, lithium, and olmesartan. So at baseline, her urine osmolality was low. Her serum sodium electrolytes were normal. Plasma osmolality was slightly high normal. On the water deprivation test, we can see urine osmolality, she's not really concentrating urine. And when given desmopressin again, there is an insignificant change in the urine osmolality. So what is the final take home from here? This lady has nephrogenic DI with drug induced and it's caused by possibly lithium in her drug history. As I said, uh, it, it would be a very simple, straightforward test, except for these patients who have partial DI and primary polydipsia, where it is not, the water deprivation test is not really highly discriminatory. And there is a wide overlap in these cases. In fact, diagnostic accuracy in studies of the water deprivation test has been almost only 70%. That means we need other measures of diagnosis of, DBI, uh, of DI. Plasma AVP concentrations could be considered. Uh, raised plasma AVP would go in favor of nephrogenic DI, very low levels in favor of central GI. However, there's several assay problem assays uh, of the uh, problems with the assays of arginine and vasopressin, which makes it commercially non-viable. Therefore, plasma AVP measurements really have not picked up. The surrogate marker of plasma AVP has been considered as co-peptin, which is co-secreted. It is, in fact, a part of the pre-pro-vasopressin molecule, which is then cleaved into vasopressin, neuropheisin, and co-peptin. And it is secreted from posterior pituitary in equimolar ratio to AVP. In fact, co-peptin levels strongly correlate with plasma AVP levels, and it is easy to measure because of uh, it being a glycosylated peptide, it gives high, uh, uh, good results on uh, routine commercially available assays. So a high baseline co-peptin would suggest nephrogenic and a low level would suggest central DI levels. But most patients will fall in indeterminate range. So a hypertonic saline infusion would be uh, the next step to go. So if the Baseline plasma copeptin is somewhere between 2.6 to 21. Hypertonic saline is administered with very close monitoring. And as soon as the serum sodium goes above normal, that means some use a cutoff of 147, some use a cutoff of 150. At that point of time, test is discontinued, sampling for copeptin is done, and the patient is advised to drink water as well as hypotonic IV fluids are administered. If the plasma copeptin remains below 4.9 on osmotic stimulation, it goes in favor of central DI. If it rises above 4.9, the diagnosis is primary polydipsia. However, this is practically not possible in, since copeptin is not available in most countries. So what we're doing is a therapeutic trial of desmopressin. So desmopressin has to be given under very close supervision. Possibly that's what happened in our very first case, but it was an unsupervised. If the symptoms improve and the osmolality of C uh, plasma and serum sodium levels remain normal, it suggests central diabetes insipidus. Nephrogenic will show no improvement. And in primary polydipsia, while polyuria would cease, thirst might not improve. And there's a risk the sodium and plasma osmolality might start falling. So that is you know, catch for primary polydipsia. Further, a detailed evaluation of etiology is important for central cases. Uh, Contrast-enhanced MRI is important. What you might find is absence of posterior pituitary bright spot, a thickened stalk, or central tumors and other factors. Anterior pituitary function in central DI cases must be assessed because a lot of these patients may have causes which may also present as hypopituitarism. 
uh, Langerhans cell, uh, uh, cell histiocytosis must be evaluated for with a complete systemic evaluation. And it has to be remembered that adrenal insufficiency may sometimes mask DI, and this becomes apparent only after starting glucocorticoid replacement. Uh, we'll take quickly two or three very quick cases over the next two minutes. A 42-year male increased thirst, nocturia, and frequency of urination for about six months. He used to drink about 10, 11 liters of water a day. No significant history in the back. His physical examination is by and large unremarkable. Urine osmolality is very low. Serum osmolality is by and large normal. No other biochemical abnormalities. On water deprivation test, his urine osmolality increased only to 160, but when desmopressin was administered, it increased to 510. That's clearly more than 50% increase. So this is a case of central DI. And what was seen on an MRI was the pituitary bright spot was absent and the patient had a thickened shock. Further evaluation revealed anterior pituitary functions were by and large normal, but mild hypoprolactinemia, which could be a stock effect. Skeletal survey, chest x-ray, antibody sc uh, screening was normal. So what was possibly considered here is that this patient has lymphocytic infundibular neurohypophysiitis with a differential that uh, LCH, germinoma, other slow-growing tumors might still be there in the background. So sequential MRIs uh, for at least one to two years are warranted. The last case is an 18-year male. He presented with increased thirst and symptoms for two months. He used to wake up frequently at night to pass urine, also had headaches, fatigue, and blurred vision. He'd recently lost about uh, four kilos of weight over the last three months, uh, normal body weight. On examination, the only clinching finding was limitation of upward gauge and a left temporal visual field defect, which did suggest that there was something happening intracranially. Serum sodium was high, urine osmolality was low, and plasma osmolality was high. Rest of the exam, systemic biochemistry was normal. In the anterior pituitary functions, he had a low baseline ATM cortisol and plasma ACTH and also had central hypogonadism. So what we have a patient here is with central diabetes insipidus with hypopituitarism. MRI showed two lesions. One was a pineal mass and a pituitary lesion. Now, such a presentation could possibly point in favor of a germinoma, but supposedly the pineal lesion was not present. We had to think of other differentials like hypophysiitis, craniopharyngiomas, or pituitary adenomas as well. Lastly, post-op DI can occur within first few days of surgery, and we need to rule out other causes like fluid overload can be a common cause of post-operative diabetes insipidus. If a lot of IV fluid has been administered in the perioperative or preoperative period, then osmotic diuresis resulting from hyperglycemia, steroids, or mannitol can be another thing that we have to exclude out. So urine production rate of more than 300 ml per hour for two or three consecutive hours with low urine-specific gravity would be a clinching a point for hypotonic polyuria in the post-op period, suggesting DI. And this should be associated with elevated serum osmolality, serum sodium excessive thirst. Uh, there are some studies that have suggested that serum copeptin might help uh, identify patients who are at higher risk of post-operative DI when measured within the first day of surgery. So after surgery, if serum copeptin is very low, this patient is likely to go into central diabetes insipidus in the imaged post-op course and would need more vigilant monitoring. So I think uh, what we need in the nutshell is a careful clinical evaluation, documentation of hypotonic polyuria, and then a focused evaluation of AVP kidney axis. We do not have to assume diagnosis, but do a focused evaluation and also a radiological evaluation. So I'll conclude here. Thank you so much for the patient hearing. Thanks. And hand back to Dr. Ashish. Sir.